introduce you now to Kate Norman, who is a digital and design comms specialist at Cumbria Partnership NHS Trust. Okay. Thank you. There's your flick there. Thank you very much, Caroline. So first of all, I'd like to say hello to everybody. Can everybody say hello back? Hello. My name is Kate. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about staff engagement, and I've added in a bit of Bob Dylan as well. So I'm using the title of The Times Are Changing, and they definitely have over the past four years that I've been working for Cumbria Partnership, um, which is a mental health community and specialist services trust that covers the whole of Cumbria. So for most people, when I first started the Trust, social media was a brave new world. It wasn't what most clinical staff were expecting was going to be in their job at all. But from what I can see, definitely clinical staff are naturals. In fact, to me, they're the experts. And they've shown me and taught me so many things about how to engage using social media. So where have I come from? So my background is that I'm a computer programmer um, and I was employed by the Trust um, as part of a, a transition to move our communications from a very one-way communication into a two-way communication form. Um, and where some of where that comes from, I don't know if anybody's read the book um, The Clue Train Manifestos. Hand, hands up if you ever read The Clue Train Manifesto? Oh, just, okay, just one or two. But it was a book that was written in 1999, um, and it talked about how there was going to be a step change in the online world, and that the use of technology was going to put the human touch back into the corporate world, and that it was going to be a transformation in the way that we did business. And that's definitely what we've seen um, over the last you know, 10, 15 years since it's been, been published. Um, and everything in that book that I, even if I read back today, has come through to fruition. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic read if you haven't, you know, if you haven't had, a, had a read of that before. Um, I definitely recommend it. And essentially what he was talking about was that instead of the way that the internet had been used, which was a very um, publishing way, essentially we were just putting a brochure online as a website, that the changes in technology was going to allow for um, that change in communication. And examples of that I would sort of cite as things like patient opinion. So instead of just having um, a website that people would actually be able to communicate and engage in a two-way. Um, and... From there, there's been a, a spawn of sort of boom and bust of, of internet booms where we've seen things that sort of Anthony mentioned earlier on of things like Friends Reunited and Bebo, communities that have bubbled up. And not, not all of them have, um, have persisted. And I think that's definitely going to be happening more and more as we go along. The future is going to be changed faster and faster. And it's going to be part of our jobs to sort of, you know, keep up with it and not be afraid of, of where it's taking us <coughs> in the information age. So back to staff engagement. Now, staff are the biggest asset within the NHS. I think I've got a stat here which um, comes from the NHS. Um, I'm trying to think of where this came from. But it, it was about the, the NHS in England um, spends roughly 55% of its 1.6 billion budget on staffing. So that's 58.4 billion. And that, that was a couple of years ago. So... Involving our staff and supporting them and giving them access to training, skills and knowledge to use these tools more effectively, to me, working in communications is part of my job. And that's been part of my job and development of the Trust's use of social media over the last four years. There's a really good briefing paper which was written by NHS employers, which is Briefing 88, which you might want to have a look at if this is an area of interest for you, um, which is on staff, uh, social media and staff engagement. So what is it about? So really for me, it's about bringing the inside out and the outside in. I'm working in a, an area of the country that is very rural and has historically been quite isolated, both geographically and digitally. So um, our mobile signals haven't been great and neither has our broadband. But as those things are changing, we're able to capitalise um, 
on using digital technology, whatever that may be, including social media. So bringing the outside in means that our staff and our communications professionals aren't so isolated in their professional practice and they can connect via things like we communities to other healthcare professionals to develop their, their learning. Um, and also bringing the outside in, so it's, it's basically um, collaborating with our patients in any way that we can um, to help drive feedback and, and improvement within our, within our trust. So there are three types of engagement. This is sort of like a stand, a, a sort of a, a well-known um, levels of engagement, but typically there are three. So engaged employees work with passion and feel profound connection to their company. They drive innovation and they move the organisation forward, which I think, you know, obviously speaking with the Innovation Academy, that's really where we want the majority of our, our staff to be. But sadly, that, that isn't the case. And, and you know, I've, I've met hundreds and thousands of staff within the NHS over the four years um, and there's so much variety in terms of where, where people are. Um, sometimes that's just because of, of history of the development of the NHS over time. Um, some staff have, you know, been damaged by, um, by the organisations that they've worked in historically and the attitudes to all sorts of things that they have faced. Um, and I think it's, it's up to us now to really help drive that positivity um, so that more and more staff are engaged and less um, affected by uh, the constant change that the NHS is going through. So not, in, not engaged is employees are essentially checked out. They're sleepwalking through their de work, work day. They're putting in time, not energy or passion, into their work. Um, and then the actively disengage, where employees aren't, aren't just unhappy at work, they're busy acting out their unhappiness every day, and these workers undermine what their engaged co-workers accomplish. So, knowing that, I had a few aims about um, what my part of my role would be, and it's not just about social media, I, I sort of support the communications team and the trust as a whole, developing all of its digital assets, the website, intranet, um, and all projects that involve digital communication within the 64 services that we run. But essentially, it was about Good communication being the job of, of all members of staff. Now, that's something that in our communications team, we, you know, is, is our mantra. Th that communications isn't solely the job of the communications team, but it's our job to sort of enable and support and, and provide advice and guidance to all of our staff, the 5,000 staff that we have in Cumbria, um, to communicate as well as, as possible and improve at all times. We also had, um, and this is probably back in about, 2012 or 13, that vision from our communications leads and our governors that we wanted to have a more of a digital first approach um, to communications and that was I think before digital first was sort of coined by um, sort of the government agencies um, and uh, that, that now sort of use it as a standpoint. Um, and also improve the culture of improvement and learning. So myself, I've always been in interested in learning and development and so from my first three months um, I took up the opportunity to become a learning leader within our organisation and look at the trust use of social media and also where we could take that, that forward. So there's also a, a slide share that I can, I can share it with you about the research that I did back in 2012 that was on the trust use of social media at that time and what my views were on how we could keep moving that forward. So transferable digital skills and confidence, you know, the more that we use these tools, the better we get at them. So exposure to um, digital technology and digital communications will inevitably lead to better use of them. And looking at how we could reduce isolation by um, use of social media in a rural digital healthcare environment um, and sharing more of the good stuff. Because from my point of view, quite a lot of the communications in the media and also um, possibly through some of, some of our channels that we advocate, um, they don't always allow for how much good stuff there is really happening in, in the world of the NHS. So actually just opening up our doors and letting our staff share their good stories was something that we wanted to have as a name. So overall, the future looks social. 
and that not using social media in the future will seem as um, redundant um, as not using a phone or email or, in the old days, fax and pager. But essentially, social media, as Anthony said, is here to stay. So we need to learn how we can leverage it as best we can. And that means enabling our people to, do, to be their best. Um, and that engaged staff are happy staff. And happy staff means improved care for our patients. So the main thing that my job was, was really looking out into our, our world, our, our trust, and seeing where we were and where we needed to be. Um, and our, our intranet at the time, even now, didn't really enable very much social engagement. Um, we were working on a, a version of SharePoint, which is 2007, and I can say that we currently are still working on that version of SharePoint 2007. But it was about trying to use the tools that we had to sort of better use them rather than just leave it, you know, leave it where, where we had it. Um, but most of the, the work that I was doing was going out and getting out from behind my desk and trying to meet up with clinicians and basically give them that support in their own environment. So essentially going out into their workplace instead of expecting people to come to me to get that support and advice. And that what my job was to do was to help a, a culture of digital communications flourish. So what has been created over the past four years? So in, in reflection, we have tried a number of different ways of using things like Yammer, um, using innovative um, tools for social media, not just the mainstream ones, Facebook and Twitter. But the ones that have worked the best have been Facebook and Twitter. Um, and we've created what I can only describe as sort of a, a subculture of those innovative, engaged staff who are engaging with the trust and with individuals, one-to-one, um, -one, peer peer-to-peer, you know, in the round, using these social tools. Um, but it is essentially still an under-bubbling of these, these staff that use these tools um, and not not even 50% of the staff, I, I would say, are fully engaged in using, using these tools. But from the communications point of view, it's all about sending out those right signals. And that's what we need to reinforce in our day-to-day -day job. And that is making use of social media normalised. Um, and encouraging staff that there shouldn't be anything that they should be fearful of um, and that the guidance and guidelines and advice and support is out there should they need it. Um, that includes in our trust documents, putting sort of the Facebook and Twitter icons on to sort of share those signals, um, but also not... Um, when staff are wanting to use these tools, putting on the blockers, I think that's what Anthony was talking about, the, the sort of light touch governance, not automatically saying, no, you can't do this, but actually helping them think through how they can use it. Do they have the resources enough within their teams to use these new tools and, and helping them work through and think about these innovative ideas that they have about using social media, what would work and what is, what is sustainable and achievable. So that's part of my job. So what's helped? Um, I think there, ha there is that element that really people need to see the leaders actually using these tools. Um, the most, the biggest difference that I've seen was um, our associate nursing director who became the, uh, our, our chief nursing officer, um, Sarah Monroe, when she went to a leadership um, course and after she came back, she basically, she she'd seen the light and that, that social media was going to be something that she wanted to incorporate into her professional practice and that she wanted to see all her associate nursing directors learning these tools and starting to, to use them. So role modelling is a very important part. And that, that goes from Claire Malloy, who's our chief executive and um, who has a blog and has a Twitter account, to all of our directors who also have Twitter accounts on our face, oh, no, sorry, on our website. We have a list of um, the directors, but they also have their Twitter handles next to each of their names. So again, those signals to sort of say that having, you know, having a social media presence is normal and good and right. Um, 
and also the clinical leads. I mean, I can't thank them enough, um, people like Janet Folland, David Storm, and, and Richard Thwaites, in using, basically using these tools and having a presence on, on um, Facebook and Twitter um, so that I can then help them become involved in the conversations that happen on social media. I don't think that makes sense to anybody, but I've put an example of this on, um, on my Twitter profile. I've pinned it to the top of my profile, and it was an example that happened this weekend where a patient, a, a member of the public, had asked a question relate, responding to a post that we'd put on Twitter. Um, I'm not a clinician. I don't know the answer. But we've basically developed this culture of um, the people that are on our social media channels, I can call upon them by tagging them or, or mentioning them in my posts to incorporate them into the conversation. So the Trust Facebook and Twitter account offers sort of that central um, body, that's it, that central voice, and then I basically include the relevant clinicians in responding to the, the members of the public or the patients' questions. Um, so there's an example of that on my Twitter account. And also HR. I mean, I have to say, they haven't been at the forefront of sort of saying, knocking on my door saying, I want to use um, LinkedIn, we want to use this sort of offer our recruitment. Um, they have asked me to come in for a number of different training sessions, and I think the ball is now starting to roll in terms of HR taking ownership of these channels themselves instead of it feeling like it, it belongs to the communications team. Um, and all frontline staff. Um, I think, you know, from my four years, the, the passion and the pride that I've seen and the knowledge that I've seen within our clinicians, that is what I want to help show and help bring in um, for, you know, for our patients to to use and have that, that relationship between the, the clinician and, and the patient or the community. So what else has helped me? So uh, this is Kath Hughes, at Kath Hughes on Twitter. Um, it was her that, that basically decided that there should be a, a new role within communication, digital communications, and I'm glad to see so many more roles um, mm -hmm. that have been created in the past year that have a similar mm -hmm. title. Um, it was also endorsed by our governors, um, Celia Tibble, who was one of our governors who were in the, on the Communications Council, was a massive advocate of using Facebook and was sort of asking questions about, you know, in 2012, why don't we have a Facebook account, you know, let's get one set up. Um, but also all of the communications team that I work with. So I could never do this all on my own. Um, most of the work that I do is supporting my team to learn these digital skills where they, you know, they may need that support um, and helping them spread that knowledge. The other things that might help you all is just being connected, things like these types of events where we get to meet each other. Um, but being a really good listener and also sharing more of the good stuff around keeping my creative spirit alive. I did multimedia design as a degree, and sometimes in the NHS it can feel like the NHS isn't the most creative of spaces. Um, so trying to keep creative and using our imagination and actively using it on a day-to-day -day basis helps me do my job better. Having some professional development within my um, trust, um, the learning leaders course which was part of the learning network really helped me get the confidence to basically change some of the policies, change some of the, the, the practices that were already embedded and to start to try to change that culture. Um, it was the first time when I'd had a clinician ask me that they wanted to have a, a Twitter account and that had come from our research department, a lady called Param Kundal um, who had, was wanting to do that as her professional practice. And the other thing that's helped me most is the situation. So my history is that I've worked previously in the digital inclusion um, sector, so working with the T Tinder Foundation um, and Digital Unite with people who are actively um, disengaged from digital communication and um, are the laggards, I would maybe say. So when I, before I worked for the NHS, um, I worked for Digital Unite supporting older people to get online. Um, the oldest person I think that I worked with was a lady called Ivy Bean, who was 106 and was the oldest user of Facebook. So I know for myself that nobody is too old to learn. And the thing that's helped me over time is that time is changing um, and things are moving on very quickly now. Um, 
and that adoption is increasing in digital confidences, that we've moved from this early majority and we're now moving into the late majority. So traction is happening in terms of use of social media and these are becoming completely normal. So I've got some 25 tips. I'm not too sure how I am for time, but I'm literally going to speed through these. Um, think in circles, not triangles. It's not about hierarchies anymore. It's about networks. So having people, imagining them around the campfire, really is what I try to imagine when I'm engaging with people online. I basically try to create a space for people to sit around a problem or a question and then help the right people get around the table in a virtual world. Learning planning strategies, so um, PDSA cycles, and um, on the right-hand side, this is a model for micro-strategies, which if you haven't used it and you work in communications, um, Kath Hughes and, and ourselves as a team are a big advocate of, of starting to use these models, um, of thinking about the outcomes before we think about the delivery. Lots of people come to us and say, we want to have a Facebook account or we want to have a Twitter account. And it's really sitting down with those groups or services or individuals and thinking, well, what are the outcomes that we want to achieve? Mm -hmm. And let's talk about what platforms that may be best for you to use. Helping people move from analogue to digital. So again, it's about the signalling. Um, on the back of our Trust Talk, which is our staff magazine, we have a page which is all about the top tweets for that, you know, that quarter. So signalling to staff that this is, this is completely normal and that we are happy as a trust for staff to use social media and engage um, is part of this transferring people from we're using mainly analogue skills or analogue communication to digital communication. And as a communication team, trying to make sure that our content is as shareable as possible. So people love photographs of other people's faces. It's just definitely the best content that, that gets shared around is pictures of, of groups of staff mm -hmm. and doing what they do you know, best, working in teams. Um, things that are taggable and strong calls to action. Anything around staff awards also really gets good traction. So I remember the first time I went to our Spotlight Awards, um, which was our annual awards, I was tweeting out who was winning each of the awards and sort of who the, who the, the runners-up were. And it was the first time that I'd had mass engagement from, from different members of staff. People came out of the woodwork that I'd, I'd never, you know, had never engaged before. Um, we had a, 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 tweet, a porter who was tweeting, you know, trying to sort of uh, big up the staff that were working in his local area. And that, for me, was one of the revelations, is that there are so many people who are lurkers, and sometimes it takes the right content to get people to have a voice. Um, I was at a meeting last week with some heads of comms in Manchester and there was a bit of talk about Facebook at work. Um, so there's definitely room for looking at what these new platforms will be, but I think we have to be mindful about what, um, what we'll be able to afford in terms of uh, paid services in the future um, and what is going to be sustainable before we tie or tether ourselves to these new platforms. Um, the main thing that I would say about them is that, I, you know, I've tried to launch a Yammer network about three times in the last four years across my trust, and each time it's been rejected for various different reasons. I think that's the ready, steady, go element about, you know, it's really just sort of pushing these boundaries to get ourselves ready for using these new tools. Um, but that... Really, it has, the culture has to be right and the numbers have to be right. So we have to have a, you know, the scale of numbers of people and sometimes our organisations or our groups are quite small for those groups to really thrive. Food wives I always find works. Uh, this is a picture of um, some cake pops that I made to um, give to a group of 35 district nurses who were on a digital transformation journey. Um, food bribes, I think. <laughs> and clinical staff work. Recognising and rewarding our staff and giving them instant feedback. Having good guidelines and SOPs. Essentially the same thing. I don't think you have to create your own. Those guidelines and SOPs are already out there. Having informal education opportunities. Um, social media services at surgeries and teacher nurse to tweet Tuesdays was something that we've done in the Trust. Uh, this was a tweet that um, one of our lead nurses, Leslie Dodd had posted. She was at the RCN Jobs Fair and um, she, she's now changed it from teach 
a nurse to tweet to teach a nun to tweet. So we've now got nurses teaching nuns. It's all about continuous professional development, and I think the, the points that you were making earlier are really important about making it professional development. Having it fun and creative, and this is a picture of our CPFT advent calendar, which is sort of um, running between now and Christmas to engage with our staff. Being informal is okay, but be direct and supportive if guidelines have been broken. That is part of my job. Um, being professional is great. Use the tools that are available to you, like LinkedIn and SlideShare. Writing is good for you, so having a blog isn't any, you know, there is no problem with that at all. Having that platform for you to share your professional knowledge is good. Mm. And this was one thing that we did try. It was about the, the advocacy of staff and just seeing where we were culturally. Um, about 18 months ago, we launched a Twibbon, which sort of coincided with the launch of our new brand, which is the sort of little heart that you may have seen on, on some of the, the pictures I've shown earlier. Um, I did a, made a list of all of the staff that were on our, on our Twitter network, and I launched this campaign, which was, I work for CPFT. If you do too, add a CPFT Twibbon to your profile. And we had about 88 people sharing that. And those, that Twibbon, that heart that's on staff's profile picture now persists. So that will be something that we'll be trying again. It's very cheap to, to try and I definitely recommend it. And creating, helping develop and create the in-house video content, which John will be talking about a bit later. Keeping pushing the boundaries, dreaming big. Uh, this was a tweet that I'd sent about, could we start a TEDx, TEDx NHS? And a lady called Gemma Self got in touch with me a couple of weeks later and said, we're, we're doing it, do you want to get involved? So I got involved with TEDx NHS. So taking the opportunities where you can find them. Um, using insights and lists. Being good at managing and measuring, it's that thing that we were talking about, is you have to manage and measure it in some way. So finding the best ways of doing it for you. And not being afraid to try. Even yammer three times. <laughs> Thank you very much. that have an impact on the culture of an organisation, do you feel? I mean, what's been your experience within the Trust? Is it too soon to talk about the culture of the Trust changing or not? I, I think it definitely has. It, 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 there is this subculture, though, and I think at some point things will just flip. It, I think that happens in cultures that um, at some point the conditions are right in the environment and things will just, will just throw it throw, flourish and thrive. It just takes the right conditions. What I've been working towards and what our comms have been working towards is really developing that and, um, and making the landscape right for proper engagement. A thing that I was going to mention, uh, I haven't quite got to it, but um, what will help our trust and we've got something called our, the participation strategy, which we're developing. Um, and it forms that ladder of engagement that Alex was talking about earlier. Um, and I think what we've been doing is preparing the culture and, and improving the culture within the trust so that when the time is right, all of our staff will be better prepared and able and confident to, to engage more fully. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you very much.